Good morning, everybody. Isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Woo, always. Amen. That was a good answer, Pastor Devin. It's always good to be in the house of God. Man, look at all your beautiful faces. Man, oh man, oh man. The Lord's faithful, huh? Come on, y'all. You made it to church. You could be anywhere this morning. You could be in jail, but you're not. You're in church. Come on. You could be broken down on the side of the road, but you're not. You made it to church. Come on, you could be sick and in bed, but you're not. You made it to church. Come on, somebody is doing something in your life. And if God has breath in your lungs, then he's got a reason for you to be here today. Amen. And we're just going to trust that he is who he said he is, and he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. We've been in this series called uh, Same God. And the subtitle of this series is Discovering the Great I Am. Amen. And so we talked about Yahweh. We talked about Jehovah Jireh last week. This morning, we're going to talk about Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, the healer. And uh, the Lord just kind of um, just kind of showed me some things. I've never really preached about Jehovah Rapha. I've preached plenty on healing, but I've never really preached about Jehovah Rapha. And uh, how many of you know when you're reading the Old Testament, you have to read it in light of the New Testament. Yes. Amen? So if you're just reading the Old Testament and saying, my God, God's going to strike me dead. Well, maybe, if that's all that you read. But when you read it in light of the New Testament and what Jesus has done for us through the, the death, burial, and resurrection, it changes everything. It changes everything. And I'm so glad that the Lord has made a way where there seems to be no way. Come on, because we would be just like the Israelites in the wilderness right now if it wasn't for Jesus. And so let's look here in in, uh, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22. Now this story, you know, it doesn't really get talked about too much because it's sandwiched together by two huge, huge stories. So right before this, the Israelites walked through the Red Sea on dry land. And then the waters of the Red Sea took out the armies. So this is right after that. And this is right before manna or bread came from heaven. All right? And so it just kind of is just in here, just really, really small. It's not really big. There's not a lot of people that want to talk about it, but... We're going to talk about it here this morning. In verse 22, it says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. I mean, your human body can probably only last about three days without water. Okay? And so here they were. They weren't just tired, but they were dehydrated. They were exhausted. They saw the faithfulness of God in a water act literally three days ago. But now they're saying, God, what are you going to do now? The God that was faithful to bring them through the Red Sea on dry land and swallow up the armies in that same water. Now, I love that story. We're not really talking too much about it, but people are like, well, you know, the sea, maybe they crossed on a shallow part. Well, then the the miracle is that that whole army drowned in a couple of inches of water then. Okay, so you take it whichever way you want to take it. There was a miracle that happened there. Come on, there's a miracle that happened here for the Israelites, and literally three days later, they're upset with God. How many of us have been there? We've experienced the faithfulness of God. We've experienced the miracle power of of working in our lives, something that just could never happen any other way, and then three days later, we're like, God, come on. I, don't, I think the commonality in all these stories that we've been talking about in this series is that they're all human beings, and we're human beings. So don't get down on yourself because you're going through something that a human being is going through. Okay, it's been three days. They haven't drank anything. But now in the ver- next verse, in verse 23, it says, now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara because they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Wow, okay, great. We're following along pretty good. Three days later, remember, verse 24. And the people complained against Moses. They said, what are we supposed to drink, Mo? 
you brought us out here. Surely we saw what God did three days ago, but now God's not powerful enough to get us something to drink. And so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them, and he said, if, now this is the Lord speaking to the Israelites, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I've brought on the Egyptians. For I am, remember we're discovering the great I am, for I am the Lord who heals you. So God is saying, I am Yahweh, your physician. In verse 26 there, he, he, he literally declares that it is his nature to be the healer to those who obey the word of God. And a healer is to recover to health. So some people are thinking, well, he just made the water clean. Well, look, is there some things that are in us that might be bitter? There's some things in us that get rooted down into a root of bitterness, and that is some of the reason that a lot of people have not experienced healing. Come on, uh, unforgiveness is huge. But when he's talking about, I am the Lord who heals you, he's not just saying, well, thank you, thank you for cleaning up the water. This is talking about everything that you are made up of. Your spirit, your soul, your body, your relationships, every part of you. He's saying, this is what I want to bring to health. That word health, you all know what health means. It means to be sound. It means to be well. It means to be a good health or be the state of being free from injury or illness. You know, some of us, we've just stayed in the wilderness of our sickness. We've stayed in the wilderness of our disease. And you can see a picture here. I'm, I know it's just, I'm, and we're going to get to some good stuff in a minute, but this is pretty good. Yeah, come on. God told Moses to take a tree and put it in the water. The water that was bitter and the water became sweet. Now, if we look at this in the light of the New Testament, you can see we had a bitterness that was on the inside of us. We were bitter with God. We're bitter with people. We're bitter with everything. And the Lord brought something on a tree. And when that tree hit the bitterness, everything changed. So you see it in the light of the New Testament now. He's not talking about the cross and Jesus here, but you can see what Jesus did. When that cross, when Jesus hung on that cross, sickness came, and, or sickness left, and disease left, and healing came. Because it took what was bitter and made it sweet. So healing is for your whole being. You say, well, he's sweet in the water. It's not just about the water here. You need to see he changed, like if they started drinking, you can imagine three days without water and they saw this little, little, you know, patch of water and they're like, I'm just going to get some. And they start lapping it like dogs. All of a sudden, they're probably sick to their stomachs. And so it wasn't just the water that became sweet, but I do believe there was physical healing that happened on the inside of them that took the sour stomach out of them. Now, look, the Israelites should have known better by this point, right? They should have known better. They've seen the miracles of God. They seen, just saw the Red Sea. And then, you know, there, there's so many books, you know, that are dedicated to these clowns walking through the wilderness. And if you go over to Numbers chapter 21, Numbers chapter 21, isn't it fun getting in the Old Testament? And verse 4, how many of you, these are the same people, the same people that just experienced the bitter waters turning clean and turning sweet to drink, same people, and now they're still journeying. In 21 and verse 4, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. How many of you, just a reminder 
of what had happened. And they, they went around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Come on, some of us, we're standing and we're believing God for healing, and we've come to a place of great discouragement. Yeah. You're in good company. You're a human being. Yeah. You're a human being. They became very discouraged on the way. And the people, now look, this is, this is where things changed. Because he had just said in, in Exodus chapter 15, if you keep my commands, if you hold fast to my word, if, 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 if you do those things, then I'm not going to put these curses upon you. They knew what the Lord had said, but yet they still got mad and spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. And they said in verse 5, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, there's no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the thing that you believed God for and he supplied as a promise to you, all of a sudden they said, that's worthless. The things that the Lord has healed you from in the past. You say, yeah, but how come he's not healing me now? You're doing the same thing and saying it was worthless. In verse 6, now look, he told them, if you do what I tell you to do, you'll get what I told you you'll get. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, there will be consequences. In verse 6, he says, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. What if, uh, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about Jesus the healer. I thought we were talking about God the healer. Why are you talking about a bunch of snakes coming in and killing people? Because we need to get to verse 7 and verse 8. Come on, come on. If you just stay there, you're like, man, God's a real jerk. But in verse 7, he says, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Look at guys. This is where the heart change has to happen. You might be in a season where it feels like there are fiery serpents surrounding your ankles, but there needs to come to a point where you stop cursing God and start blessing him and saying, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against the Lord. And God, we're praying today that you take away these serpents from us. And so Moses prayed this out. And the Lord said to Moses, take, in verse, in, in verse, uh, 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 verse 8, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Come on, remember, we're looking at this in light of the New Testament. Make a fiery, fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at this bronze serpent, shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, that when they looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. We look at this in the light of the New Testament. If you look upon what Jesus did on the cross. A lot of people aren't healed because they're not looking at the right thing. You're looking down instead of looking up. Come on. You're looking at the condition instead of looking at the promise keeper. And he's saying, I've put my son up on that cross to take sickness and disease and lack and sorrow and grief and all these other things and broken heartedness and, and bad relationships. I put him on the cross. And if we're not looking at the work of Jesus and the finished work of Jesus that happened on the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection, then you will remain sick in your body. Because all you're focused on is the condition. This plague of the fiery serpent was sent upon God's people was really a self-inflicted punishment resulting from constant murmuring. The beginning of this year, you know, sometimes churches are like, hey, we're going to go with this word for the year. You know, a lot of churches came out with a rhyming word for four. 
the year of the open door, right? Into 2024. The year of falling on the floor, 2024, whatever. And I said, mine doesn't rhyme at all, but this is still true. You will have what you say, nothing more and nothing less. So many people, unfortunately, are going to finish out 2024 the same way that they started. Because they're too focused on the condition instead of looking up and seeing the finished work. You know, Jesus even referenced this right before he talked about that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, in verses 14 and 15, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so it is with the son of man. When he be lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. So you need to see this in the light of the cross. Jesus was implying that the bronze serpent typified his being raised on the cross. And so our healing, and both spiritual, spiritual and physical, it comes from looking to and identifying with Jesus Christ crucified and realizing that by his stripes we were healed. Well, many of us, were not healed because we haven't been looking at the right thing. We've been looking at the serpents. We've been looking at the lack of water. We've been focused on the bitter instead of focused on the sweet. You know, you got to realize bitterness and, and all of those things and sickness and disease and unforgiveness, it's not part of the Jehovah Rapha package. Sickness is part of the curse. I read this last week, and I'll reference it right now. They'll put it up on the screens in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ has redeemed us. You need to realize that on the cross, Jesus was not sick. Jesus became sickness. On the cross, Jesus was not poor. He became poor. Come on, on the cross, Jesus was not sinful. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Look, it's either we believe this thing or we don't. I love how the Message Bible says it like this. Christ redeemed us from that self-defeating, cursed life by absorbing it completely into himself. In pre-service prayer this morning, somebody talked about sponges. You talked about sponges? Who else talked about sponges? Justin talked about sponge. And so what you put into a sponge is what's going to come out of your sponge. Jesus, full of grace, full of truth. Jesus, full of healing. Jesus, full of freedom. Jesus, full of prosperity. On the cross was squeezed out. And all of those things that were within him came out of him for us, and he took everything that was in that place on him. Divine substitution. Look, sickness is a part of the thieves package. Disease is part of the thieves package. If it's coming to steal from you, if it's coming to kill you, if it's coming to destroy you, then it's not from God. You say, well, that seems pretty simple, Pastor. You would not believe how many people go around and say, well, the Lord has just put me through a test or a trial right now with this sickness. Do you know how the Lord is going to teach you? He's going to teach you by his word and by his spirit. Hallelujah. Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundantly. In John chapter 10 and verse 10 and 11, he says, the thief does not come except, you can say it like this, the thief only comes to steal, 
The thief only comes to kill, and the thief only comes to destroy. It's not a blessing in disguise. He said, I've only come, the thief has only come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, this is red letter in your Bible, if you have a red letter Bible, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, even until it overflows, the Amplified Bible says. So fullness of life or the abundance of life. I need to say it like this. You need to stop carrying something that Jesus has already carried for you. Well, I just got this burden, this sickness. I don't know. The Lord's really trying to teach me something. Hogwash. Stop it. There was teaching in churches for far too long that this is something that, well, I don't know. It's just really, no, I, I don't know. The Lord's just, every time I feel this, I start praying for, maybe, I don't know, but there's no scripture reference for that. I'd rather just declare what the word says. That by his stripes, we were healed. Come on, how many of us were, were trying to just, well, I just, I don't know. It's just always been a struggle. Yeah, you keep saying it. It's always is, it always is going to be a struggle. Jesus paid way too high a price for us to live bound by sickness and disease. Sickness is part of the curse, and we've been set free from the curse. They say, well, in the Bible, you know, I don't know, there's nothing mentioned about the disease that I have. Well, guess what? There's probably a lot of scriptures and, you know, there's a lot of diseases in this world right now that are not mentioned in scripture. But there is one verse in the curses of Deuteronomy. Come on, if we're going to believe God for the blessing, we also need to identify the curses and know what you've been redeemed from. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 59 and 61, he said, serious and prolonged diseases and sicknesses. He also said, every sickness which is not written in this book will come upon you till you're destroyed. It's part of the curse. So even if it's not written in this book, go ahead and take that curse and mix up some faith with that curse. You say, but it's the curse. It's not the blessing. You need to know that you've been delivered and redeemed from the curse. I don't care that it's not written. I mean, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV. I don't know one. I'm not. I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. And my heart is to stop seeing people just bore, you know, heavy laden with serious and prolonged diseases and sicknesses that they just seemingly identify with like Jesus never did anything. We've been redeemed from that sickness. As a matter of fact, back in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, this is the prophet Isaiah prophesying about Jesus in verse 4. And he said, surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs. That's not just a, a broken heart. He said in that word grief is sicknesses, weaknesses, distresses. And he's carried our sorrows. Those sorrows are pains, those pains of punishment, those things that we have just kept on us instead of giving it to the Lord. He said, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my guilt, for my iniquity. That the chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by Jesus' stripes, we are healed. This is not just about, well, I just got to carry this thing. It's not about, the, if you look at these words in the Hebrew, that word born, it goes to the Hebrew word nasa. Which whether you, whatever your thoughts are on space, nasa is nasa. And that word born literally means to lift or to bear up, to carry, to take away, or to carry off to a faraway place. And to bear it continuously. Surely Jesus has bared this sickness continuously. 
Do you know Jesus doesn't have to come back and do again what he's already done? It's already been done. Now, we see this all through the Gospels as Jesus was walking around. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 4, and then we'll get over to Luke chapter 5 here in a minute. And I believe we're going to pray for some people for healing this morning. Amen? In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, he said, Now Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. And his fame went through all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. You look at this in the New Living Translation, I I just love, Jesus traveled through the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom, look at, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. There was nothing that was off the table. He said, if it's trying to steal from you, if it's trying to kill you, if it's trying to destroy you, I am here to take that away. Well, Justin just said it, how Jesus found himself in the scriptures. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me, right? And he anointed me to heal the sick and to heal the brokenhearted. Come on, he anointed Jesus and the same mandate that is on Jesus is now on his body, the church. Imagine if Jesus was just walking around sick all the time. Hey guys, let me pray for you. Why would I want you to pray for me when you can't even believe God for yourself? You say, that seems very mean. No, it doesn't seem mean. It it seems like I understand who's living on the inside of me. Come on, someone. He healed every kind of sickness and illness, and news went about as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him who were all all who were sick. And and he goes on, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed, epileptic, or paralyzed, he healed them all. Come on, you all. He healed them all. Every one of them. Not one was untouched. Not one said, went away from that place and said, man, I really wish he would have touched me better. Not one of them. Not one of them said, well, maybe next time. I guess my healing's not for right now. Not one of them. Well, Jesus, you didn't call out my thing. So I guess I'm not going to get healed tonight. He healed them all. Now, Peter references what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, and he says it like this, who himself bore, that same word bore, to lift up, to bring to a faraway place, to get rid of, to carry constantly. He said, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. I know it's not on the screen right now, but it should be. Praise the Lord. By whose stripes you were healed. So I I don't know, I don't know, I've never heard all this teaching like this before. Why? Why have we kept healing hidden? Come on, if we could have enough faith to believe God for salvation, guess what? Healing comes from the same source. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, he said, Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever. Come on, God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same healer that took the bitter out of the water and made it sweet is the same healer that will take the bitterness out of our hearts and produce healing in our hearts. Come on, the same healer that will take that bitterness out and produce healing in our body. It's the same healer that will take bitterness out of our heart and our soul and wash us with the washing of the word and make us clean. Same healer. I believe healing is here, Hallelujah. and healing's for today. Yes. Well, Brother Hagin, a great, great man of God, great preacher, he said, unbelief is the thief of God's best blessings. Yes. You know there's two kinds of unbelief? The first one is just ignorance. It means you just don't know that this was even available, right? 
And so that's why Jesus, you know, even when he went to his own hometown, he couldn't hardly heal anybody except for a few people. But then he went, a, went about in a circuit teaching from one town to the next, to the next, to the next, the principles of the Lord. Amen. So the cure for ignorance is teaching. The second kind of unbelief is what the Pharisees and the doctors of the law showed in Luke chapter 5. They were unpersuaded to act on the word of God. They had educated unbelief. I believe we're living in a time where a lot of us have probably come. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know some of us have definitely come from uh, uh, denominational type teachings, right? Right? We've come from places that have told us that God doesn't heal anymore. We've come from places that said the Holy Spirit doesn't move anymore because that which is perfect has already come. We have the Bible, and people agree with this, and then all of a sudden they close up the gifts of the Spirit like they don't exist. I don't know about you, but I need the Holy Spirit in my life every day, more and more, every single day. And I'm telling you, if the Lord isn't a healer, then I'm still living under the curse. And I'm not going to bear sickness and disease on my body because he already bore it for me. Come on, he already bore it for me. And so T.L. Osborne said it like this. He's a great evangelist and teacher of the word. He said, many of you guys are waiting for me to quit teaching so you can get your healing, but I'm waiting for you to get your healing so I can quit teaching. Yesterday or a couple of days ago, last week, I don't know, uh, uh, Ruthie has been down in Texas and she's getting to visit her mom and, and she went to a youth camp. And she's been in this youth camp, uh, you know, she was there for three days or something like that. And I'll tell you, one of the services, she told us it went to 1230 in the morning. And Jess goes, a lot of people, a lot of believers today could not handle that. It would be like the preaching of the Apostle Paul where the guy fell out the window because he fell asleep. Come on. Some of y'all in here, I'm not pointing fingers. I I used to, when I preached in in California when I had my church there, I used to preach and I had a water squirter gun. (laughs) Man, I would, I mean, everybody knew it. Like, you don't fall asleep. Not at my church. Don't even close your eyes and act like it's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. You keep your eyes open. Well, I'm just letting the Lord minister. You liar. Look up. And then I just take that little gun and just squirt them with a little water pistol. Come on, but there's many people who can't even last 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. They check out after 5, 10 minutes. And uh, I'm so excited to see Ruthie come back. full of fire, full of fervor, come on, full of excitement for the things of God. Not looking at the watch and not looking at the clock and saying, well, what am I, what are they going to do now? How much longer is this going to take? But saying, God, what do you want to do with me during this time? Come on, if we're really believing God for revival, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us sitting here for a little bit. It's going to take us being in the presence of God for a little bit. It's not going to just come instantaneously because you prayed some magic fairy dust prayer. It comes by people really seeking and really uh, desiring a move of God. And it'll start with you. You're ever, there's a lot of people just waiting for everybody else to get revival started, but it starts with you, and that fire can spread to other people. So I love what T.L. Osborne said about that. But the sim- simplest definition of faith is to simply act like the Bible is true. In a service like this, when you're hearing scripture verses about this serpent on the pole, when you're hearing about the water hitting the, the tree hitting the water, you need to realize what happened on that tree. You need to realize what happened when Jesus hung upon that cross, that you are not who you used to be. You're no longer bound by sin. You're no longer bound by unforgiveness and bitterness. There is a way for you to walk free of those things and walk in divine health and to walk in healing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Glory to God. I know there was times in my life where, uh, and I've shared this about healing, when one of my first back surgeries, the first back surgery in California, I came out of that awful. I fell down. I 
parents were there. Ruthie was there. And seemingly everything was going wrong. And I started just focusing on the condition instead of focusing on the promises. And everything that was coming out of my mouth was about the condition. That's all I identified with the condition, 100%. I did not identify with the blessing. I could care less about the blessing. And I was supposed to be pastor in a church at that point. I remember even talking to God and saying, God, I'm pastoring a church and I can't see to read my Bible. How's this going to work? I can't be a pastor that's blind. I can't be a pastor who can't study and read. I mean, I know there's guys that have done it. But I held myself in this little tiny place and trapped myself in the condition. And my mom came out with this little book, and I believe some of you all have it. God's Creative Power for Healing by Charles Caps. And in the middle of that book, about 10 pages or so about confessions that you make over your body. You will have what you say, nothing more and nothing less. And I've got these, I've got these things printed out. And these are the exact confessions that I made when I was laying in a hospital bed, when I still had a catheter in, when I couldn't use the bathroom by myself, when I couldn't see because I had double vision, and then I had fourth nerve palsy in both eyes, and it looked like all the walls were caving in on me. And my mom brought this in. She goes, Josh, we're going to say this. And I said, I don't want to. Didn't I? I said, I'm not saying it. I should never even be in this condition right now. I started doing exactly what the Israelites did in the wilderness. The Lord had been faithful in so many different seasons, and I started to do exact, I started to curse God because I did not receive the fullness of a healing, and then the rest of my body started deteriorating. And one of these confessions in here says, as God was with Moses, I still can't even say it. So he is with me. Come on, we're just talking about Moses. We're just talking about the guy who lifted up the serpent on the pole. We're just talking about the guy who struck the Red Sea and it parted. We're talking about the guy who, who saw manna come down from heaven. That same God uh, that was with him is with me. And I remember my mom saying this. She goes, Josh, we're going to say it even if you've got to say it one word at a time because I couldn't even see the paper. They had to read it to me so I could repeat what they were saying. In that same confession, he goes on. He says, my eyes will not be dim. Neither will my natural power be abated. Blessed are my eyes. For they see, and blessed are my ears, for they hear. And she started reading this to me, and I I said, I can't say that. I said, I can't say it right now. I don't believe it. I go, every other thing, I'll believe it. But that one, I can't say it. It's too much for me. And this was a struggle, because everything that was coming out was just about the circumstance. Amen. Remember, your mom probably said this. I know my mom said this. If you don't have anything good to say, <laughs> don't say anything at all. I think a lot of the body of Christ would benefit yeah. from simply not saying anything yeah. unless it lines up with what the scriptures yeah. say. And it was, it was days 
It was days and I just stopped talking because I knew that everything, I knew the power of my words. And I said, I'm not going to say anything because everything that I'm saying, I'm just declaring the curse. And little Ruthie at that time, three years old or two and a half or whatever she was, it was 2010 or something like that, 12, 13, I don't, I don't really remember, but she, she was one of those, you know, she was young. And she, uh, you know, she came in and she had this little pink guitar. Y'all remember the Isaac message? We were just talking about it the other day in a meeting. And when I was clearing out that Isaac that I had in California, I came across the pink guitar. I sent Jess a picture. I go, this is the guitar. I go, this is, this is a toy that was used as a minstrel. This is amazing. Sometimes we limit young people because we're like, man, they can't do anything. They're just dumb. They're stupid. They're little kids. They, no, they have the same Holy Spirit that we have. And Ruthie got up and she had this little pink guitar and she started playing it. And it was not the melody that goes with the song. But as you all know, she's got amazing tone and amazing pitch, and she's just an amazing worshiper, and she sings her heart out at home. I mean, it, there's something that just blesses my socks off, you know, when she's not listening to, you know, Taylor Swift, that she listens, <laughs> you know, to, she worships in her room. And I'll be downstairs in my office or sitting in the living room, and all of a sudden I'll just start to hear my little, my not-so-little girl worshiping the Lord. But it started at a young age, and she knew the power of worship. And she got up in there, and she started, and she took this milk crate out. I, I don't know. She like knew, like, I'm going to make a, a stage, you know. And she took a milk crate, like a plastic milk crate, and she stood on the milk crate, and she started pressing these buttons, and then she started singing, He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. I'm telling you, in that moment, it broke my heart of stone. It broke the unbelief in one line of a song. And I started weeping like a baby. And I welcomed Jehovah Rapha. I said, this is beyond me. God, I need to be able to see. I need this. I need this, God. And I started making these confessions of faith. At that time, coming out of back surgery, I was on, I don't even know how many different kinds of medicine. My dad loved to over-medicate me because he was trying to make me feel like what he felt like in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and I started seeing things. I started hallucinating. I was laying there in the bed. I started seeing literal snakes coming down underneath the paint. I, and, and just seeing things that were not there. Thankfully, they got the meds right after this. I remember they called the doctors and said, hey, uh, uh, he needs more medicine. Like, we gave you enough for two weeks. It's only been like three days. <laughs> oh, but here was the difference. Every time they even brought me meds, they brought these scriptures and they brought these confessions. And I said, Josh, we're going to take the word now like medicine. Is your body in pain? Absolutely. But we're going to take the word like medicine. Is your heart hurt? Absolutely. But we're going to take the medicine. Is your, can your eyes not see? Well, absolutely. That's, that's the fact at the moment. But we're going to take this medicine. And every time they brought in and drugged me out of my mind with these high narcotics, they also declared the word and I started speaking the word. 
made a supernatural recovery, and then I went to an uh, ophthalmologist for my eyes because my eyes were a huge thing. You know, the healing from my back took a little bit of time, but my eyes were super concerning to me. And he went there, and we, my dad was sitting in the room with me, right, in Santa Barbara. And they did the whole eye test and the, you know, click it when you see it or whatever they do, you know. And, and, um, and they said, you've got fourth nerve palsy. Your left eye is blind in like three quarters of it. And uh, he goes, this, this stuff, it doesn't just change. So don't expect that it's going to be a quick turnaround. You remember him saying that? He said, this could be six months, could be a year, could be two years before you experience anything different. And if it doesn't change by two years, this is just what you're going to have to deal with. I remember at that time we were driving a Chevy Impala and my dad was driving because I couldn't see anything. And I would look at the clock because it had a big clock, you know, right? Like a digital clock on the stereo. And I would cover my eyes because I wanted to test it. Because I was believing God for healing. I'm saying this. As God was with Moses, so he's going to be with me. My eyes will not be dim, but they will see the way that you've created them to. And I started, and I just did this. And I wanted to see. Can I see yet? Can I see yet? Is it crossed? Do I have double vision? Do I have any of these things going on? And I remember testing because I, got, I just knew that God was going to heal me. His word will not return void, but it will accomplish what it was sent forth to do. And so as I was confessing the word, I, I just I remembered one morning I woke up and all of a sudden, I think it was my right eye came back first, came back straight. Because when you had fourth nerve palsy, they just relaxed and it looked like everything was like this roof falling down. And it makes it very difficult to walk or do anything. And this eye came back straight and I'm just like looking around and I'm like, Oh my gosh, when I move my head, the room goes with it. Like I don't feel like I'm falling down. And uh, literally a week later, I did this with the left eye and the left eye came back. And then we had a follow-up. Come on, this is what the word does. We had a follow-up with the the ophthalmologist, I think two weeks later, a month later. And he's looking at my old scan and he's looking at my new scan and he goes, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. I can't explain it. I go, I, I saw a different physician. <laughs> and it came back. And I'm telling you today, I'm four, almost 42. I have no problems with my eyes. I can see perfectly. There's no more double vision. There's no more fourth nerve palsy. There's no more blindness in my left eye. All of that came back the way that God designed it to come back. But I kept his word. I kept his word in my mouth. Come on, some people do have a form of faith, but it's dead faith. It's dead. But you know what? With dead faith, you have to carry dead faith. But living faith will carry you. And dead faith, it's no different than a dead Jesus. But if you've got a living faith, you know that Jesus is alive. E.W. Kenyon said it like this, your voice builds the road over which faith carries its mighty cargo. So when faith comes, sickness goes. There was an assembly that was written about in Luke chapter 5, and i got to do this pretty quickly, but in Luke chapter 5, you all okay this morning helping me a little bit? Luke chapter 5, I just love this story. In verse 17, now it happened a certain day that Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of God was present to heal them. I want you to get that word them on the inside of you. Because here in this room this morning, the power of God is present to heal them. Everybody that's in this room, whether you're fighting with an ailment in your physical body, and whether you're fighting with a broken heart, whether you're fighting with a hard heart, whether you're fighting with things going on in your mind, he is present to heal all of us. And then behold, look, this is a story. I just love it. The man, they ripped the roof off the house. 
The man on the bed was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. They couldn't find how they might bring him in through uh, because uh, of the crowd. So they went up on the housetop, and they let down his bed through the tiling in the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, you're healed. No, he didn't. He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And we go back to Moses. And when that tree hit the water, it took the bitter and it made it sweet. This is the same thing, same Jesus, same God discovering the great I am. Jesus is saying, look, I did some work on the tree and it's about to hit the water of your heart. And when that water of your heart is hit, those sins are forgiven you. The bitterness has gone. He deals with the heart issue first. Look, the religious people of that day, in verse 21, the scribes, Pharisees, they began to reason. Come on, this is not faith. It's, 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 unedu- or it's educated unbelief. And they said to them, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived, uh, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and he said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? Come on, if you've got Jesus living on the inside of you this morning, you've already got half of this equation. And the same God that forgave you is the same God who is telling you to take up your bed and walk. Verse 24, but he says, but, you, you, that, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he said the man, to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose before them. He took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with great fear. And they said, we've seen some strange things here today. I believe it's time for the church to see some strange things again. Come on. It's time for the Lord to move just like he did here in Luke chapter 5, just like he did in Exodus 15, just like he did in Numbers 21, that the, the tree is hitting the water. Come on. The serpent is being lifted up. And when you keep your focus not on the condition but on the promise keeper, healing will come. And healing is here. The Lord is present to heal them. The power of the Lord is present to heal you. Is it your heart this morning? The power of the Lord is present to heal you. Is it your mind this morning? The power of the Lord is present to heal you. The power of the Lord. He's in the house. Come on, y'all. He is in this house. Father, we thank you. We put a demand on that power here this morning, God. We thank you, Lord, that you are the healer. You are the healer, God. You are the healer. We thank you, Lord. You're still Jehovah Rapha. You're the same God that healed the water. You're the same God that healed the bitterness in the stomachs. You're the same God that when they looked upon the serpent on the pole, that healing came to them, God. You are the same. You're the healer. We thank you, Lord, for your healing power flooding this house right now. 